Welcome to unit two of our course. In this unit, we're going to be exploring the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic views of personality, starting with Freud and some other early psychoanalysts this week. Note that while some people use these terms interchangeably, psychoanalytic is traditionally associated with the early movement in this field, whereas psychodynamic typically refers to the later development and or offshoot of psychoanalytic theory. So this lecture will focus primarily on psychoanalytic views, but at the end, I'll introduce some psychodynamic theorists that we'll explore in more detail over the coming weeks. The assigned reading uses the term psychodynamic because it includes not only the portion assigned this week, but also a section on object relations theory that will be assigned later in the course. Before we talk about Freud specifically, let's look at some of the basic assumptions that underlie psychoanalytic theory. First, one of the hallmarks of psychoanalytic views is the assumption that all behavior originates in the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is believed to be comprised of mental processes that are inaccessible to our conscious mind, but that nonetheless influence our judgments, feelings, and behaviors. According to psychoanalytic theorists like Freud, the unconscious mind is the primary source of all human behavior. Our feelings, motives, and decisions reflect our past experiences, but are stored deep in the unconscious where we're unaware of their influence. As you might imagine, this rules out self-report data as a means of understanding someone's personality. If people are not aware of what motivates their behavior, it's a lot less interesting to get their opinions on it. Therefore, psychoanalytic views are informed by observation and interpretation by those trained in psychoanalysis which is where projective measures like the Rorschach are most valuable. This leads to the assumption of psychic determinism, which refers to the concept that everything a person does has an identifiable cause. That is, human behaviors never happen by accident or by chance. There's no such thing as random or meaningless behavior. Instead, all human behavior is determined by the consequences of previous occurrences, or otherwise stated, determined by the outcome of previous events. Our behaviors, and all psychological phenomena for that matter, are choices that are heavily influenced by unconscious drives and instincts. Behaviors always have meaning, purpose, and are goal-directed, and it's all rooted in our past experiences. And what happens when a bunch of unconscious drives and instincts are fighting to influence behavior? Conflict. And how do we view these conflicts? Well, according to Freud, in everything. That includes offhand comments, dreams, transient thoughts, and any other behavior, tendency, pattern, etc. All of which reflect past experiences stored deep within the unconscious mind. According to psychoanalytic views, parts of our unconscious mind are constantly struggling against each other and influencing various aspects of our behaviors and personalities. Ultimately, psychoanalytic theory assumes that our adult behaviors, feelings, personalities, etc. are shaped by our past experiences that, again, are stored within the unconscious mind. Additionally, the ways in which our personalities are shaped reflect the different drives that come up in different stages of development, which we'll discuss later in this lecture. Freud argued that libido and aggression, in particular, are expressed differently at various stages of development, and these tensions result in important drives that shape our developing personalities. So, while you may be wondering why your friend will not break up with their partner who treats them poorly, psychoanalysts would explain their behavior through unconscious motivations. Maybe deep down, that's what your friend thinks they deserve, or maybe they're in denial about how badly they're being treated, or... Perhaps they cope by focusing on those few good moments rather than the risk of being separated or of being alone. So let's dive into Freud. But before we do that, I want to say that while Freud is widely considered to be the father of psychoanalysis, it's important to note that Freud himself credited the initiation of the field to his fellow physician, Joseph Brewer. So, Freud... Let me start by saying that this lecture has some ideas that have really stood the test of time, like the fact that we're influenced by our childhoods. But Freud also got a lot wrong, like the fact that women all have penis envy, and thus are inferior to men. I'll get to that later. Or that homosexuality reflects some kind of developmental error, or that the cure to depression is cocaine. Spoiler alert, it's highly addictive, and it doesn't cure depression anyway. In this lecture, we'll go over the major facets of his theories, especially as they pertain to personality rather than to therapy. 
We'll conclude the lecture by discussing a few other important psychoanalytic voices that have further evolved this theoretical lens. While Freud wasn't right about everything, he did have some very important contributions to the field of psychology overall and to the field of personality psychology specifically. Freud was trained as a physician, a neurologist to be precise, which influenced his scientific and systematic approach to psychology, or at least what was viewed as scientific and systematic at the time. He was most interested in understanding and helping people recover from hysteria and neuroses. He differentiated neuroses, which is basically modern-day anxiety, from hysteria, which is closest to the modern-day diagnostic category of functional neurological disorder, which until recently was known as conversion disorder. The major difference between hysteria and neuroses is the degree to which the person maintains contact with reality. Hysteria is viewed as more severe compared to neuroses. Freud identified three specific types of neuroses. Realistic is essentially anxiety related to actual threats in our environment, which basically makes it the idea of fear. Neurotic anxiety refers to our id impulses, but unlike realistic anxiety, it's related more to our internal worlds. Notably, Freud acknowledged quite a bit of overlap in realistic and neurotic anxiety. Moral anxiety is related to the superego's attempt to restrain behavior in socially and ethically acceptable ways. If there's conflict, moral anxiety arises. And what do we do with our anxiety? We defend against them, of course. Ego defenses, which we often refer to as defense mechanisms, are those strategies we engage in automatically and unconsciously when threatened. Freud argued that repression was the most basic defense, which is how so much of our experience and impulse ends up relegated to the unconscious. While Freud and Brewer did mention ego defenses, it was actually Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, who first published the written account of specific defenses. We'll discuss Anna and explore some of the more impactful defense mechanisms later in this lecture. But first, back to Freud. One of Freud's main ideas was that people could experience catharsis through conscious recollection. His psychoanalytic approach to talk therapy was developed on the assumption that the unconscious is manifesting in hysterical and or neurotic symptoms. His remedy was to bring these influences into the conscious mind such that the person could consciously recollect their traumas. He believed these were best uncovered through hypnosis, dream analysis, a technique known as free association, in which the psychoanalyst observes and interprets the patient as they speak openly, kind of like writing in a journal, stream of consciousness style, but aloud, and through projective tests, in which the analyst interprets the patient's response to vague stimuli, like in the Rorschach or the thematic apperception test. Ultimately, Freud believed that you had to overcome repressive defensive mechanisms in order to bring unconscious material into awareness. How do dreams help? Well, they're viewed as having important manifest content, which reflects what we actually remember, and latent content, that is, the underlying meaning of the dream. The latent content gives a psychoanalyst clues into the id's desires, an aspect of wish fulfillment, which we'll discuss in a bit. To sum it up, what set Freud and his contemporaries apart was their view that psychological trauma would manifest in symptoms that could not be explained by the person because of their unconscious influences. Psychoanalytic therapy was developed as a process of catharsis that involved helping so-called patients remember their trauma in order to alleviate the associated symptoms. Adult personality, from Freud's perspective, was a result of these earlier life experiences held in the unconscious. On the next slide, we'll dive into the topographical and structural models, and later in this lecture, we'll review the psychosexual stages of development as well. The foundation of the Freudian psychoanalytic perspective is seated in the hierarchical structure of the mind, referred to as the topographical model. Freud identified three levels of consciousness. The top of the consciousness hierarchy is the conscious mind, followed by the preconscious, and then the unconscious minds. We'll discuss these in more detail on the next slide. After that, we'll look at another hallmark of Freudian theory, the structural model of the mind, which includes the id, ego, and superego. You can see both of these reflected in the popular iceberg metaphor. 
though it's important to note that Freud did not introduce this idea and often cited Theodore Lips as the creator. Freud theorized that the mind could be subdivided into three levels of consciousness. Using the iceberg analogy, the conscious aspect of the mind is the peak of the iceberg and reflects everything above the surface of the water. Translation, it's the mind we're aware of at any given moment, the thoughts, feelings, and images we're thinking about right now. You can think of our conscious mind as synonymous with awareness. It's what we're currently accessing and could articulate in a logical, rational manner. Immediately below the surface of the water is the pre-conscious. Technically, the pre-conscious mind is part of the unconscious. It is beneath the surface of the water. But unlike the majority of the unconscious, it can enter our awareness where it touches the water. The difference is that the pre-conscious represents what we can access, while the unconscious reflects what is inaccessible to our conscious mind. You can think of the pre-conscious as the memories we know we have. You weren't thinking about it a second ago, but you could probably remember the last text you got if you wanted. You'd be bringing that information from your pre-conscious to your conscious mind. These memories do not take very much effort to recall, and every time you recall them, you're moving them from your pre-conscious mind to your conscious mind. Underneath the preconscious, deep in the waters and inaccessible from above the surface of the water, is the unconscious. It consists of all of our hidden drives and impulses that are generally unacceptable to us and or to society. It also houses specific instincts such as hunger, thirst, and desire for sex, as well as repressed childhood memories. Freud saw the unconscious as a source of desire and as a holding place for urges, feelings, and ideas that are tied to anxiety, conflict, and pain. Of course, what's in our unconscious is not gone. How would it be influencing us so much if it were? Instead, it's simply out of reach to our conscious mind. From a personality perspective, Freud put all of his eggs in the unconscious basket. He argued that unconscious material not only exerts an influence on our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but can also give us a glimpse into a person's personality. How? Well, when unconscious material surfaces in disguise, it's the task of the analyst to interpret it and make it conscious. Dreams and recurring nightmares, inexplicable physical symptoms of fear or anxiety, irrational interpersonal experiences, and the world-famous Freudian slips of the tongue all provide the analyst with a glimpse into the unconscious mind. Freudian slips are explained by the motivated unconscious, from Freud's point of view, there's a reason for everything you say or do, and an analyst can help uncover the motivation behind each of them. You might have seen the meme of Freud explaining that a Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but mean your mother. I mean, another. He also believed that most symptoms of mental health conditions were caused by unconscious motivations. Let's move on to the next pie. I mean, slide. The structural model of the mind was Freud's way of conceptualizing the competing internal forces that we feel. The structural model has three components that coincide with the topographical model, and these are the id, the ego, and the superego. Interestingly, Freud believed that all three of these structures begin as the id, which develops into the ego, which then further develops into the superego. The id reflects everything we have at birth, including our instincts, drives, and temperamental tendencies. The id just wants to get its needs met now, which is often referred to as the pleasure principle. It is not concerned with what's right, acceptable, desirable, etc. It just wants what it wants. These impulses are rational, uninhibited, instinctual, indulgent, and completely impulsive. It's simply guided by the pleasure principle, whatever it needs to do to reduce any tensions and to seek immediate gratification. You could think of the id as a crying baby. That baby isn't concerned with who they might disrupt by crying. They want to eat, and they want to eat now. And they're certainly not going to patiently wait while mom heats up their milk. Its drive towards satisfaction and lack of reasons to restrain itself operates on the primary process, which involves forming an unconscious image of an object or event that would satisfy the need. But since we can't interact with our unconscious mind, a secondary process is needed from which we interact with the external world via the ego. The id is simply interested in wish fulfillment. 
even if only through dreams and fantasies related to those primary process images, and it is completely uninhibited in doing so. That's the importance of analyzing latent dream content. It provides insight into that pesky id and all of its desires. The ego is the middle ground between the id and the superego. Unlike the id that seeks immediate pleasure, the ego is grounded in reality and its ties to the external world. Also, unlike the id, the ego is not present at birth, according to Freud. The ego evolves from the id in order to better manage the id. The ego is willing to delay gratification in order to meet the demands of reality, such as cultural norms and societal expectations. The ego, therefore, deals primarily with the outside world and operates mostly in the conscious and pre-conscious minds. It encompasses higher level functions, such as attention, concentration, perception, forethought, impulse control, and social reasoning. The ego operates on the reality principle, which takes the outside world, or reality so to speak, into consideration when considering the internal demands of the id. It really wants to meet the id's demands, but in a socially conventional and acceptable way. The aggressive id impulse might make you want to slap your partner, but the ego might direct you towards punching a pillow instead. So, it tries to control the id and uses reality testing as a means of delaying the impulsive and often irrational needs of the id. If the risk of the id's impulse is too high, the ego must determine an alternative. If there's no safe option, the ego will delay the action while it constructs more plans and tests those plans for feasibility. In order to delay the discharge of the id's tensions and or to delay gratification, the ego uses secondary processes. Whereas the primary process is the id's way of satisfying a need, the secondary process is the ego's way of relieving id tension. Freud argued that one of the main tasks of the ego is to monitor these various tensions and to find an appropriate means of reducing that tension. Unlike the good old id that'll do whatever it wants to eliminate tension. Keep in mind, though, the ego isn't a total buzzkill. It wants pleasure. It just wants to seek it at the appropriate time in the appropriate way. Speaking of appropriate, the superego is deeply invested in determining right from wrong and directing behaviors towards the ideal. From Freud's perspective, the superego is the last to evolve and is developed as a moral compass for the individual. You could think of the superego as the embodiment of parental and societal values, what's right and what's wrong. This process of incorporating values is called introjection. The superego operates based on two subsystems, the ego ideal and the conscience. The ego ideal comprises rules for good behavior or standards of excellence. It tells us what to strive for. The conscience, on the other hand, comprises rules about what not to do. What are the things that our parents disapprove of or that we're punished for doing? If we don't listen, that is, if we do something our parents would disapprove of, the result is the feeling of guilt. Ultimately, the superego has three goals. One, to prevent rather than just postpone, like the ego, any id impulses that parents, and by extension society, would disapprove of. Two, to force the ego to act morally rather than rationally and three, to guide the person towards perfection in thought and action. It's a moral compass after all, but unlike the ego, it's not grounded in reality. A healthy personality needs balance across these three structures. If the it is too strong, the person will be obsessed with self-gratification and therefore quite selfish, inconsiderate, and impulsive. If the superego is too strong, the person will be obsessed with rules and if not followed perfectly, consumed with guilt. The term ego strength refers to how well the ego can effectively balance these id and superego forces. In a healthy personality, we have ego strength to the extent needed to create this balance across these various forces. Freud saw people as complex energy systems. The energy used for psychological processes, known as instincts, are created and released through biological processes he referred to as drives. Drives reflect biological needs and their psychological representations. For example, dehydration is a physiological state that prompts thirst, which reflects the psychological experience of the instinct to drink water. These drives build until the tension can be released. Freud categorized drives into two main categories. 
those related to life and those related to death, though he gave much more attention to life compared to death energies. The life or survival instinct is referred to as Eros. Although Eros creates libidinal energy, this is not a purely sexual drive. Instead, Eros relates to all life or survival instincts, which includes pleasure of all sorts, whether reproductively driven or not. That is, it pertains to drinking water as a survival instinct as much as it does to having sex for pleasure or for reproduction. That libidinal energy prompts behaviors such as cooperation and other pro-social actions because these drives compel us to sustain our own lives and of our species. And to do that, we need to be healthy, safe, and interconnected. This might remind you of inclusive fitness, which we explored in the biological materials earlier in the course. Cathexis is essentially the idea of how we attach our libidinal energy to our life experiences. Since libido is a limited source of energy, it can get tied up in certain relationships or past experiences to the extent that an insufficient amount is available for current relationships, causing them to suffer. So, that friend who can't stop thinking about their ex, and therefore is hardly present for a first date with someone else, is likely sabotaging that new relationship before it could start. Freud believed that these life instincts were opposed and in competition with death instincts, which reflect our destructive tendencies. As I said earlier, Freud was much more interested in Eros than Thanatos, and interestingly, he did not name this category of death instincts. Death instincts are nonetheless explained as an unconscious desire to return to nothingness. Life naturally leads to death, and according to Freud, the goal of all life is death. In other words, he thought that since life naturally leads to death, people unconsciously desire to return to that nothingness. And since death instincts are held back by life instincts, the effects are often invisible, and yet the tension remains. To expel this energy, we are prone to aggressive and destructive actions, which is one way that death instincts can be seen outwardly. Catharsis refers to this release of emotional tension that occurs when the drive can no longer be restrained. The evidence is mixed as to whether a release of built-up aggression is actually helpful, but it depends on the person and the approach. Many people find aggressive sports to be highly effective outlets for aggression. And it's a better workout than my Netflix binge, I'll give it that. We'll finish up our discussion of Freud by looking at his psychosexual stages of development. Freud believed that a healthy life involves the ability to direct libidinal energy to desired tasks and relationships. Problems can arise when we're unable to satisfy our needs at a given stage of development. He referred to these stages as the psychosexual stages of development. If all goes well, the person develops, quote-unquote, normally. If not, the person's libido can become fixated on particular objects or sources of pleasure, which can last for the person's lifetime, thereby derailing normal development and the ability to be a healthy adult. He broadly separated these stages into two phases, the first three stages during early childhood and the second two after that. While it is viewed as chronologically ordered, it is possible to be straddling multiple stages at once. Although Freud is fairly criticized for many aspects of his psychosexual theory, it's important to note that Freud did differentiate between sexual and genitals. By sexual impulses, he really means life impulses. He wasn't saying that at birth babies are interested in sexual intercourse. With that said, sex did encompass the idea that people derive pleasure from their erogenous body parts, whereas genital referred more specifically to the intention to reproduce. We'll look at these stages separately on the next slide. You'll also watch a video this week, What Freud Thought of Personality, which will provide more insight into not only the psychosexual stages, but some of the other concepts we've reviewed as well. The first stage, the oral stage, begins at birth and lasts approximately 18 months. The erogenous zone is the mouth, which is basically the libido focusing its energy on getting fed and satisfying the id's desire for pleasure. A so-called oral fixation, results of this need is not successfully met. Someone with an oral fixation represents regression in that they remain fixated on a region associated with an earlier stage of development. 
They therefore will continue to seek out satisfaction of oral pleasure by smoking, drinking, talking, overeating, etc. Supposedly, these individuals also have a tendency towards dependent personalities. Next, we have the anal stage, which begins where the oral stage left off around 18 months and continues until about preschool age. Now the libidinal energy is directed at the anus, and the focus moved towards mastery of defecation. Freud argued that children experience pleasure from defecation, and warns that being too strict or too lenient during potty training could have significant repercussions for the child, leading towards anal personality characteristics. According to Freud, someone stuck in this stage may be prone towards so-called anal pleasures, such as being stubborn, excessively organized, or stingy. You might be familiar with the terms anal retentive and anal expulsive personalities, which come from this very concept. Basically, people who are overly controlling and obsessive on one end and overly messy and inconsiderate on the other. Following the anal stage is the phallic stage, which reflects the last of the early childhood phase of development from about preschool age of three to about the age of six. Now, rather than focusing on the anus, the libido shifts its energy to genitalia. Freud believed this was a very important stage of development that must be successfully moved through in order to be a healthy adult. During the phallic stage, the child must differentiate between their attachment to their primary caregiver and their identification with them. Essentially, this involves realizing that the child is their own person apart from their opposite sex parent. They remain attached to their parent, but need to begin to more fully identify with the parent that matches the child's gender. This process of transforming from attachment to identification represents the Oedipus or Electra complex, which I'll discuss shortly. Interestingly, this represents a major aspect of ego formation. Whereas the later realization that parents are not perfect and they do do things that are bad leads to what's known as reaction formation, which is a defense mechanism that underlies the development of the superego. Basically, the child realizes they shouldn't do certain things that the parent does, and they develop a superego that keeps them in check. This stage is most famous for one of the theories Freud is most criticized for, the Oedipus complex, and its complement, the Electra complex, which was introduced by Jung, who we'll explore next week. Freud only discussed the male version, which is the Oedipus complex. On that note, I want to say that this stage is also sometimes referred to as the Oedipal stage for this reason, and you might see that in some of your readings. Freud has been rightly criticized for the fact that the entire phallic stage of development is focused around the penis. Boys are scared of castration, and girls are envious of those with penises. Supposedly, boys are scared of castration because they view girls as having been castrated. The Oedipus complex is built on the idea that a boy falls in love with his mother, desperately desires closeness with her, and therefore develops anger towards the father. Since the child is no match for their dad, they learn to repress that instinct. If they do this successfully, they can move on to latency. If not, we've got an Oedipal fixation on our hands filled with competitiveness and aggression. So what about girls? Girls also fall in love with their mothers, but her penis envy draws her love and attention to dad because, you know, he has the penis. Mom is now the penis rival, so the girl develops hostility towards mom instead. Freud believed girls couldn't really resolve this complex except by having children of her own. Right, so she can't resolve it at the age of five, so instead she simply represses sexual desires and moves right along into latency. There's not really that much to say about latency, except that it's latent. The only notable aspect of this stage is that infantile amnesia comes in to block all of our earlier experiences, and theoretically recovering these memories is the goal of psychoanalysis. There is a lull in psychosexual development as the child moves closer to puberty, at which time the genital stage can begin. The genital stage is the final stage of psychosexual development and reflects the person's ability to engage in appropriate sexual behaviors aimed at pleasure and reproduction. That is, of course, if you're male. Females will always have some issues because they're not able to resolve the Oedipus complex. Other theorists came along to acknowledge this issue, and we'll discuss a few of those theories at the end of this lecture. 
Anna Freud was the youngest of Sigmund Freud's six children and the only one to pursue psychoanalysis. Before she did that, though, she pursued a career as a schoolteacher, which greatly influenced her later decision to apply psychoanalysis to children. Unlike many of her contemporaries, Anna believed in the majority of Freud's theories and was a strong supporter. She conflicted heavily, particularly with other female theorists at the time, like Melanie Klein, who we'll discuss shortly. One notable aspect of Anna's background is that unlike her dad and most of the major theorists at the time, she did not hold a formal degree in medicine or psychology. In fact, she did not attend college at all, though she was awarded a variety of honorary degrees later in her life. Nonetheless, Anna's contribution to psychoanalysis with children was a major feat, and she deserves her place in history. We'll talk about another innovator in the field of child analysis, Melanie Klein, at the end of this lecture. Anna was influenced not only by her experiences as a schoolteacher, but also by World War II and her work with children who were orphan survivors of concentration camps. Notably, the Freud family was Jewish and were able to escape Vienna by way of Sigmund Freud's connections. The family immigrated to England, where she remained invested in the improvement of treatment for children and established multiple clinics and nurseries for children impacted by war and or troubled for other reasons. Interestingly, it was Princess Marie Bonaparte, great-grandniece to Napoleon Bonaparte, the Emperor of France, and also wife of Prince George of Greece, who paid for the Freud family's escape from Austria. Bonaparte was a patient of Freud's, and also a close friend. She was also a notable female voice in early psychoanalysis too, though less influential than Anna. In addition to her impact on the development of child psychoanalysis, Anna was the first to explain defense mechanisms in her 1936 book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. Let's review the concept of defense mechanisms. Basically, the id has wishes, the ego cannot fully restrain the id, and this causes anxiety that defense mechanisms protect against. These defense mechanisms can protect us from the outside world, or the inside world, or both. Essentially, defense mechanisms are our instinctive attempts to protect our ego, the core of who we are, and are directed at the anxiety caused by unfulfilled wishes. She acknowledged that these defensive strategies are natural, but she also observed difficulties that stem from using them. Ultimately, she concluded that while useful in the short term for defending against pain in an immediate sense, we harm ourselves in the long run by being unable to deal with reality as it is. Her book was an attempt to help people understand how to behave in order to improve themselves and to mature. You'll learn a little bit more about Anna Freud and her explanation of defense mechanisms in this week's video, Anna Freud. You'll also notice that there are two other defense mechanisms described in the video that we won't cover in this lecture, which are fantasy and turning against the self. I do want to strongly note that at minute 213 to 218 for five seconds, self harm is shown in the video. So please feel free to skip over that portion if it'll be triggering at all for you to view. Before we talk about individual defense mechanisms, I want to point out that these are not Anna Freud's list, though a lot of them are on it. For the purposes of this class, these are 10 defense mechanisms that are commonly discussed today. If you're interested in learning about your own defense style, you can also take the optional assessment quiz provided in this week's module. Let's start with repression, as it's the hallmark of psychoanalytic theory. The entire concept of the unconscious is built on the idea that unacceptable impulses, thoughts, feelings, and memories are kept out of our conscious awareness. Keep in mind that while people may refer to it as deliberate, it's not a conscious form of deliberate. It's an automatic response to threat that we do not consciously choose. Freud argued that the usefulness and or risk of ego defenses comes down to what they're used for. When used to ward off anxiety and other unconscious conflict and undesirable impulses, they're problematic. But if used towards growth and successful resolution of psychosexual stages, they're deemed acceptable. Suppression is similar to repression, but instead of being an unconscious process, suppression reflects the intentional attempt to force something out of consciousness. Suppression is under our voluntary control, while repression is not. Denial is arguably the most well-known of all the defense mechanisms. 
It involves refusing to recognize or acknowledge real facts or experiences that would lead to anxiety or other uncomfortable feelings. Basically, it's refusing to accept what we don't want to accept. Denial might be making excuses for a partner who erratically disappears and always deletes their text history. We know it's sketchy, but maybe we don't want to know it. So what do we do? Well, if we're in denial, we make excuses and we look the other way. Projection is another defense me mechanism I often see playing out in real life. Projection involves attributing one's own unacceptable feelings, desires, or motives onto someone else. For example, let's say you're married and you have a crush on your coworker, but instead of acknowledging that, you project this desire onto another coworker. Hey Jane, you sure do look cozy with Brandon. What's going on between you two? Accusing your partner of cheating when you have or are the one who's more likely to cheat is another common example. As is bullying or criticizing someone for something they're insecure about. It's a way of projecting our own insecurities onto someone else. Rationalization is basically making excuses in order to make a situation or impulse more acceptable or less threatening. This is basically justifying what you need to accept about reality whether it's a mistake or an uncomfortable feeling or something that happened to you. The goal is to use some kind of logic to explain it away and make it better. For example, maybe you feel defensive that someone criticized your sister's driving. You might explain that she's typically a good driver, but the traffic was super hectic that day and she didn't sleep well the night before and so she was more tired than usual. Or let's say you were particularly rude and aggressive towards someone, so you rationalize it by saying that everyone makes mistakes sometimes and you were really hungry and your parents never taught you proper coping skills. If you're familiar with cognitive dissonance, that uncomfortable feeling that arises when there's an inconsistency in our thoughts, beliefs, and our actions, you can probably see how rationalization plays a big part in keeping that ruse going. Something conflicts with what you want to believe? Rationalize it away. Intellectualization is my personal favorite defense mechanism. I'm quite comfortable in a world of intellectualizing for a psychologist. What does that mean? I have a tendency to cope by focusing on the intellectual fact-based aspects of a problem rather than actually sitting with the emotions involved. Being present for other people's feelings is one thing, but if I'm going through something difficult, I try to push it away by honing in on analysis and facts. When I was first diagnosed with a chronic illness, I drowned myself in the research literature. I wasn't remotely ready to feel the sadness and loss, but I sure did learn a lot about the medical side of my autoimmunity. Displacement involves redirecting emotional reactions from the rightful recipient to someone else entirely. Why? Because we can't always let our emotions out to the person who prompted them. If you work in retail and the customer is snarky, do you yell at them? Probably not if you value your job, which, side note, is why almost everyone I know has a short fuse for retail. What do you do instead? You snap at mom when she forgot to pick up your favorite item at the grocery store, at your partner when they call you back five minutes later than they said they would. Research, such as Hyphantis et al. 2013, has found that heavy use of displacement helps explain why certain people with more dysphoric temperaments experience higher rates of somatization than others. It seems that people who adopt a strong tendency towards displacement are more likely to experience somatic manifestations of dysphoric moods. That means they're not only displacing onto other people, but onto their own physical sensations, too. Sublimation is considered to be a mature form of defense, as it involves channeling one's unacceptable urges into a productive and socially appropriate outlet, like work or a hobby. You'd be using sublimation if you channeled your challenging life experiences into songwriting, playing guitar, or tackling someone on the football field. Having a hard day? Perhaps you use that to fuel your late-night study session. You're so pumped up, you're going to take that exam down tomorrow. Regression is another important feature of Freudian theory because it reflects the nature of an anal-retentive person or someone with an oral fixation. These people have regressed to earlier stages of development and are fixated on the erogenous zone of that stage. For a less Freudian example, regression is often seen in children who have a new sibling. All of a sudden, they go from talking in full sentences to whining and baby talk. They want to be fed when just a month ago they were fighting for that right of independence, and now they're wetting the bed again. The last defense mechanism we'll talk about in this lecture is reaction formation, which is basically acting or expressing oneself in ways that are opposite of their true feelings. This helps to explain a man who feels insecure about their masculinity doubling down on stereotypical masculine qualities like aggression. Another example is being overly nice to someone you don't like. 
The saying, kill him with kindness, didn't come from nowhere. If you're interested in defense mechanisms, there are three optional articles this week on the topic. Kramer 2015 explores the measurement of IQ and defense mechanisms using the thematic apperception test, and it specifically discusses denial, projection, and a defense mechanism we haven't talked about called identification. Schill 2004 looks at the nature of defenses and how they relate to anxiety and the pleasure principle, and You et al. 2008 investigates personality and defense mechanisms in late adulthood, including their impact on health. We'll finish up this lecture by discussing four prominent female voices in the early work of psychoanalysis leading into the later developments, such as object relations theory. While Freud is without a doubt the most well-known psychoanalytic theorist, there have been many others who have contributed significantly to the field and who are under-discussed in my opinion. Karen Horney, for one, represents a much-needed female voice in the world of early psychoanalysis. As a psychoanalyst, she drew on literature in the fields of sociology and anthropology to help inform her perspectives. In fact, she was the first woman trained as a Freudian psychoanalyst and is often credited as one of the earliest neo-Freudians. She was the first to challenge Freud's views on women and felt that she honored him by building upon his achievements. For one, she agreed that neuroses stem from childhood experiences, but unlike Freud, she thought adult experiences were equally influential. Horney agreed with Freud that women had it harder than men, but she attributed blame to men and to patriarchal culture and overall male bias inherent in society. Furthermore, she suggested womb envy as a male counterpart to penis envy and called Freud out on the naming of the phallic stage as reflective of his male-dominant bias. She felt that the very naming of the phallic stage implies that only someone with a phallus, that is, a penis, can achieve sexual satisfaction and healthy personality development. With that said, she also brought, bought into Freud's ideas that girls experience penis envy and the experience female genital anxiety related to genital harm or castration. This masculinity complex prompts girls towards revenge against men and rejection of their feminine traits. Horney agreed with Freud that anxiety or neuroses result from a conflict between the id and superego. But she expanded on his ideas by suggesting three approaches neurotic individuals take towards conflict resolution. Moving toward people, which is associated with a compliant personality, moving against people, which is associated with an aggressive personality, and moving away from people, which is associated with a detached personality. All three have value. Relationships involve moving towards. Innovation involves moving against cultural norms. And being alone with oneself involves moving away. Throughout her work, she ultimately shifted from an emphasis on gender to an emphasis on the role of culture. This was born out of her realization that culture determines the primary gender-related differences. Another area in which she challenged Freud was in terms of his fundamental belief that anxiety follows biological impulses. Instead, she proposed that anxiety is a natural response to an unsafe world, such that children who are not properly nurtured and de will develop anxiety related to their survival. While agreeing with Freud that women more frequently experience anxiety and other psychological disorders, she disagreed that it was due to an inherent inferiority, like Freud proposed. Rather, she argued that women find it difficult to fit into patriarchal society unless they're lucky enough to have a natural personality that's a good fit. Notably, she called this masculinity complex because apparently women want revenge against men and are driven to reject their feminine traits on the basis that society deems them inferior to masculine traits. This leads to an over-evaluation of love, in which women are treated in demeaning ways, then have low self-esteem, which they overcome with motherhood. Again, she really honed in on the influence of culture as a determining factor that was much more influential than the presence or lack of a penis. In her book, New Ways in Psychoanalysis, 1939, she made it very clear that psychoanalysis much incorporate culture in order to be effective. In it, she states, quote, the American woman is different from the German woman. Both are different from certain Pueblo Indian women. The New York society woman is different from the farmer's wife in Idaho. The way specific cultural conditions engender specific qualities and faculties in women as in men, this is what we may hope to understand. She also differentiated relationships from a cultural perspective. 
Exchange relationships are based on reciprocity, while communal relationships involve mutual senses of caring about each other's well-being. She argued Western cultures are more inclined towards exchange, whereas African and indigenous cultures are more likely to be communal in nature. Another awesome contribution of Horneyes was her second book, which aimed to provide people with a self-help version of psychoanalysis. In it, she suggests that people explore the role of their attachment figures in their adult behaviors and suggests that people should talk with friends and journal to help deepen their understanding of these internalized figures. This was founded on her idea that everyone is motivated towards self-growth, which she referred to as growth towards self-realization. In this week's assigned reading, you'll learn more about Freud and Horney. You'll notice the last third or so of the reading is about Nancy Chodoro and object relations theories, which we'll touch on on the next slide, but we'll further discuss later in the course when that portion of the reading will be assigned. But first, in the next couple of weeks, we'll touch on some other important voices and theories, such as those by Jung, Adler, Erickson. We'll also touch on the Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram. But before we finish up this lecture, let's talk about another important voice, Helene Deutsch. She was another notable female voice in the early psychoanalytic movement. In fact, she was one of the first female leaders of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, the first woman to head a psychoanalysis clinic, and the first woman analyst who was analyzed by Freud himself. She was also the first psychoanalyst to write a book that focused on female psychology, called The Psychology of Women, 1944, which had a volume on girlhood and another on motherhood. While she aligned with Freud in some ways, she was vocal about their differences of opinion, as well as some of her, his biggest supporters, Anna Freud and Princess Marie Bonaparte. Along with Horney, Deutsch is noted as influencing Freud's later acknowledgement as to the need for considering female psychology more explicitly. In her work, Deutsch emphasized the female libido and the significance of motherhood. Deutsch suggested that women do not want to become mothers out of a response to penis envy, but rather as a strategy for overcoming what she called passive femininity. She was the first to insist on the significance of motherhood, including the conflict between motherliness and eroticism, which was based on her own experience. She also proposed that motherhood provided women with a sense of immortality. In discussing motherhood, she differentiated it from motherliness. Whereas motherhood refers to the mother-child relationship and is greatly affected by culture, motherliness is the characteristic of tender maternal love. Besides being the first woman analyst analyzed by Freud, she's arguably most famous for her as-if personality, which is essentially a false affect that involves acting as if you're someone else. You could think of it as being a chameleon and putting on whatever colors you need to best fit in and be accepted. The person feels a lot of conflicting feelings, and to embody their true personality, they would need to accept all of these conflicts, but since that's too threatening, they act disingenuously. Freud proposed that the female personality is composed of three essential traits, which is referred to as the feminine triad or the feminine core. Female passivity refers to the woman's internalization of aggressive and sexual impulses, supposedly in response to the recognition that the clitoris is less able to be gratified than the penis. Fun fact, Bonaparte argued that the clitoris was simply an unsatisfactory little penis. Female masochism also involves internalizing the external world, but this time it's due to the desire to earn love from their fathers and a response to genital trauma. She encouraged women to develop self-love as a strategy for protecting against masochistic tendencies. Female narcissism helps protect against masochism and passivity, and supports sublimation of sexuality into eroticism. Depending on how these three traits combined and or conflict, women fit into one of three categories. The feminine erotic is when a woman prioritizes love over sex as a sacrificing mother. This passive woman represents the ideal from Deutsch's perspective, which speaks to one of the many issues with her theories from a progressive standpoint. Masculine active is when a woman is aggressive and domineering as a reaction against her fears of dependency. Deutsch believed that maturity reflects the minimization of the masculine active towards the more passive feminine erotic. Lastly, homosexual, which reflects sexual inversion caused by perceived rejection by dad, which prompts fixation on mom for safety. 
Mom then prohibits the daughter's masturbation, which prompts her to turn away from her mom and seek permission from a, quote, mother substitute, like a lover, or conveniently, a female analyst. Long story short, she was celebrated in terms of bringing attention to female psychology, but also villainized for maintaining many of Freud's stereotypes. Ultimately, while she brought attention to females, she also built her theory around the bias that women should be passive and mothering and sexual only insofar as it serves procreation. Object relations can be viewed as a spin-off of psychoanalytic theory, though it's really just a term used to describe those theorists whose psychoanalytic or psychodynamic view was heavily focused on the relationship between an infant or child and the object or person they relate to. Object, as defined originally by Sigmund Freud, refers to any target of our inborn instinctual impulsive drives. In object relations theory, this object is typically the primary caregiver or a substitute for them, like a child's blankie. Many people credit Melanie Klein as the first psychoanalyst to challenge some of Freud's theories, along with Karen Horney. She expanded on some Freudian ideas by providing a female perspective, but was a particularly staunch opponent of Anna Freud specifically. While Anna Freud was vocal about the merits of Klein's application of psychoanalysis to children, Klein was never complimentary towards Anna. In fact, she ignored her almost entirely and rarely used her name in any of her work, even when disagreeing with her theories. Klein is arguably most famous for two things. One, for developing object relations theory, and two, for applying psychoanalysis to children, which of course is where she clashed with Anna. Although older than Anna, they were contributing to psychoanalytic research and writing around the same time. And while they disagreed on quite a bit, they are considered to be contemporaries of each other. Klein's views were so influential and popular at the time that many people refer to her school of psychology as Kleinian psychoanalysis. Pretty impressive considering she never completed formal schooling either. We'll discuss object relations theory in much more detail later in the course. So for now, we'll leave it at that and explore her childhood psychoanalytic views. Klein believed that psychoanalysis was not only appropriate for children, but that it was an important aspect of healthy development. That is, it shouldn't be reserved for children with extensive problems. Klein developed her own style of child therapy and theories about childhood development based on her work with children. One innovation was the use of play therapy, which she viewed as essentially the free association of childhood. Play therapy remains as a very popular and effective approach to working with children today. One area where she strongly disagreed with Anna in terms of childhood psychoanalysis was the age at which it was deemed appropriate. She argued that infants are much more aware of others and their relation to these others, and believed that infants were threatened from birth by intense and intolerable anxiety, which she argued stemmed from the infant's death instinct and referred to as persecutory anxiety. She also disagreed with Freud's assertion that the superego develops after birth, as she believed it was present at birth. She also argued that the Oedipal complex began earlier in life than Freud proposed. Her emphasis on death instincts represents another one of her major disagreements with Freud. Freud attributed much more influence to eros, or life energy, but Klein viewed the aggressive destructive death instinct as equally influential, Of course, the fact that she thought children were appropriate for psychoanalysis reflects an even bigger disagreement, as he thought only adults could be analyzed. While Klein differed in many ways, she still acknowledged that she built upon Freud's work and had many similar views, too. For example, Klein emphasized the varieties of sexuality, while remaining faithful to Freud's original concept that sexuality is directly related to the Oedipus complex. To further this theory, she subdivided pre-Oedipal development into the paranoid schizoid position and the depressive position, which is a present aspect of object relations theory. The last theorist we'll discuss in this lecture is Nancy Chodoro, who is a sociologist and psychoanalyst who focused on the mother-daughter relationship dynamic. She is credited as the first to present object relations theory from a feminist perspective. She argued that women want to become mothers out of an unconscious desire associated with their relationship to their own mother. Maternal instinct, therefore, reflects the unconscious motivating us to relive that mother-daughter relationship. It provides the intimate connection with her own daughter while also recreating the family's triangular structure dynamic between mom and dad, except now it's replaced with partner and daughter. Essentially, by having children, Women can reimpose intrapsychic relational structures on the social world. 
and they can relate to the father of their child in terms of a family structure they were familiar with in childhood. According to Chodoro, when a woman becomes a mother, the most important aspect of her relationship with any daughter is the recognition that they are alike in that her daughter can also become a mother one day. The special connection is felt by the daughter and is incorporated into her ego unconsciously. She develops a sense of self in relation, which is essentially feeling interpersonally connected and empathetic. It's the internalization of the mother daughter relationship. The child recreates the intimacy a woman once shared with her own mother. Thus, a mother daughter bond is stronger than a mother son bond because of biological differences between men and women. Chodoro also focused this concept on object relations, such that a woman's maternal instinct to want children has been shaped by the unconscious fantasies and emotions associated with the woman's relationship with her mom. In the same way, she suggests that sons are influenced by feelings of differences between them and their mothers that foster the son's independence. They also develop a greater concern with appearing masculine given cultural influences in society. In a family structure, Chodoro believed daughters can relate to their fathers through the context of their relationship with their mother, while sons have a more direct two-person relationship.